will be knitting this until my dying day. Hi, hello, my name is Allie. I'm coming to you from just outside Toronto, and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going, and what it's costing me. So as usual, I have to have a tea. Can we have a moment for today's mug? So this one is from a Quebec ceramicist um, called Hoya Ceramics, and it's just beautiful. I got it at the one of a kind show a couple years ago. I just love it. Today I'm having um, Ahmed Tea Earl Grey, which is my like cheapy grocery store Earl Grey that I use to space out my really nice Sloan Classic Earl Grey. Um, but it's expensive and this one helps me not take it for granted and forget how good it is. Oh no, my phone moved. The frame changed. Oh god, where was it? Okay, so to start with what I'm wearing today, this is my like and other stories self-charted dupe sweater that I talked about in my Everything I've Ever Knit video. So as the basis for this, I used Amy Herzog's um, basic pullover set-in construction, but then I created the chart myself to try to like replicate this other sweater. So if you're curious about that, you can go watch my Everything I've Ever Knit video to get a few more details on that. But I felt like it was time for its moment on the channel. Okay, so it's been almost exactly four weeks since I recorded the last podcast episode where I was actually updating on the status of my knits because my last one was just my everything I've ever knit, just as if it didn't take me four and a half hours to film. So despite the fact that it's been four weeks, I don't have any finished objects to show you today. I'm just not that kind of knitter. I like big garments. It's not always going to happen. But I do have progress to show you on the cardigan that I was working on last time, and I actually made sure to stop it in a point this time where I would be able to try it on properly. We're learning, you see. See, there's a lot more going on in the sleeve department than we had last time. Okay, let's see if I can get this thing on with the many, many balls of wool attached to it. Okay, so we're really leaning into the sweater vibe today, but this is the beginnings of my No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit. Actually, side note, can we discuss, I, I find it really funny the way that we refer to like the No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit. Like I, I understand that the pattern is by Petite Knit and that's why we say it that way. But I feel like it just sounds so funny to me when we're talking about like garments that we knit up. I'm like, oh, this is my no frills cardigan by Petite Knit. Like it sounds like Petite Knit made it. No, I made it. <laughs> so this is my Petite Knit no frills cardigan by me. That's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm knitting this out of Knitting for Olive Merino um, in the color Mustard. And the We Are Knitters Touch Me Mohair, which as discussed previously, really a big misnomer. It's actually mostly alpaca. Oh, there's a hair in it, gross. It comes in these gigantic balls, like I, this one doesn't look that huge, I've also been knitting out of it, but it's actually like twice as much length as the Knitting for Olive balls are, like this is like a two to one scenario. Okay, actually this brings up a dilemma that I would like to discuss with you. So what is your rationale behind when you choose to pull from the center of a yarn ball versus the outside? I. <laughs> In this moment, I'm thinking about the fact that after I posted my last video, I told my family that I was starting this knitting podcast, and I knew that my sister was going to get the biggest kick out of this, that she was going to think this was like the most hilarious, absurd, ridiculous thing she's ever heard of. Of course she did, she delivered. Um, and, I, <laughs> and she watched the whole thing. The dedication to witnessing how much of a dork her sister is truly incredible. But I'm now just imagining my sister watching this, hearing me debate which end of a ball of yarn you should pull the string from. And hi Kim, if you're watching, this is for you. Also, yes, yeah, she did think it was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard. And then she saw that I actually got views on my last video and now she wants to be on my channel. I think it would be funny if I brought her on and just asked her to try to define knitting words. And I would really like to know if you have any good suggestions of things that I should ask her to guess what they mean, or if there's anything else that you think it would be fun to see me like talk to a non-knitter about knitting about please leave suggestions. Anyway, so when you're working with a ball of yarn, how do you decide which end to pull from? Because just when I think I've got it figured out, I've got a method, I know which one makes more sense in which scenarios, a scenario proves me wrong every time. So in this case, especially with this mohair, big finger quotes, um, I was thinking this is a ginormous ball. So I feel like if I try to pull from the outside, then it's like, it's, there's just gonna be so many opportunities for it to roll around and get tangled over the course of like the life of this belt. Like it's just gonna be a bad time. And so I was like, I'll pull it from the middle, but then because it's so big, like it starts collapsing on itself to the point of like being loose and hard to work with and easily tangled so early in the lifespan of the ball. And so I've ended up, so this one, this one I kind of started this one and it was too late and I haven't done anything with the X, it's not terrible, but like the other one, that I have attached, like one is one sleeve, one's the other sleeve. This other one, I had to like take out my ball winder and start rewinding because it was just unmanageable. 
And I don't know, and because also part of my consideration was that if I'm working with two yarns held together, I should be center pulling, right? Because then the balls aren't like rolling all over the place and like tangling with each other. And I just, there's no good way is what I've learned. There's no good way. I haven't really, hello, Cropper's made an appearance. Hey. No, you've had all your breakfast. You're not starving. So since I decided to wind this up, it hasn't been an issue rolling all around. Um, but I don't know. I'm not convinced that it won't be. I don't know. Is there a good answer? Is there just never a good answer? Do you just always have to try one and then when it doesn't work, you do the other? I don't know. Let me know if you have wisdom. I think last time I had like a little bit of the body below where you split for sleeves, but I have definitely done a little bit more of that now. Um, and I have, I'm almost done sleeves. I have one finished sleeve. Ta-da, beautiful. And I have one sleeve that I am ready to start the ripping. I've done all of the decreases, all of the length of the sleeve, so almost there. So we have our ribbed cuff all done on this one. And on this one, you can see we're very close. And as far as the length of it, I mean, we're like firmly past the territory of like 2005 shrug. Um, but we're still a very, very long way away from the floor length cardigan <laughs> that this will be. So I'm going to be knitting this until the end of time, because if we want to recap last time, last time, I think in terms of body, I think we were maybe like here and I had maybe like this much of this sleeve and none of the other sleeves. So it's been four weeks. I've knit like this much sleeve and then this much sleeve. And I just feel like when we factor that against like the fact that this cardigan currently ends here and needs to get like four feet longer. <laughs> I I just foresee this sweater and I being in like a very long-term relationship. So wish me luck. But it's gonna be kind of interesting to see how it goes once I finish this sleeve because up to this point, I've kind of been able to just decide when I'm sitting down to work on this, whether I want to work in the round but it's gonna have to be on a tighter circumference because it's the sleeve but at least I can work in the round or do I want to be able to do nice really long rows and not have to worry about you know either adjusting my magic loop or flipping something over very frequently but I have to alternate rows of knitting and purling because it's knit flat so like neither option is like my ideal knitting like I just would love to just knit stock knit in the round for days and days so neither is quite perfect but both are good for kind of different things. Like I've been finding that when I want to take this with me, if I'm going to go like visit with somebody, I would much rather be knitting long rows of the body because I just don't have to worry about meddling with it so often. But at home, I tend to prefer working on the sleeves. So it'll be interesting to see if it slows down my pace maybe once I no longer have that option to kind of choose which way I want to work on it at any given time. So we'll see. But I really wanted to get the sleeves done so that it was just kind of like straight sailing from there minus that I will have to do um the pockets so the pockets are they're afterthought pockets so technically it could be like the very last step that I do but I also don't think I want to do that I think that once I get to the point where the pockets go in I think I will probably do them pretty quickly after that so that then again it's just smooth sailing from there and when this cardigan finally reaches its full length I can just bind off and be done and not be like oh I have to like learn how to do pockets now I don't really want to do it that way I I really don't like all of the sort of like finishy, constructy parts of making garments. And I feel like if I do the pockets kind of in the middle, it'll feel more like it's just the process of knitting it. But if I wait until the end, I think it's just going to feel similar to like having to seam up like a seamed sweater when I'm done, which I despise. So <laughs> in the interest of making this, um, you know, fun, cause like allegedly this is a hobby that I like, um, yeah, I'm planning to do the pockets in the middle. I hope that that helps. I also have a new cast on this time, which is kind of novel because I often only work on one thing at a time, but I do feel like since I will be knitting this until my dying day, it's kind of important that I have other things on the go. And it's also not entirely optional because, okay, pause, dad, I love you. I love that you somehow sat through an hour long video about knitting when you have absolutely no investment in knitting but I need you to stop watching now or I can't knit things for you for presents anymore. So if you've seen my previous video, you know that all my dad wants in this world is wool socks that I've knit him. I've already knit him two pairs of wool socks and he wants as many pairs of wool socks as I can possibly make him. So happy birthday, dad. 
Now, I think in my first podcast episode, I mentioned that all my project bags are like just random drawstring canvas bags that I've received with like various purchases that I made that just happen to send you things in drawstring canvas bags for some reason. Um, and I got a new one this week. I bought a belt and it came in a bag. So this is what dad's socks now live in. So first up, I'm knitting these out of Phil Colana Peruvian in the color Limpopo or number 833. And I'm knitting the Snuggly Socks by Isabella Gerzebeg. So <laughs> this is what I have so far. Ooh, ah, so much sock. Isn't it so impressive? Um, so I, I obviously am knitting these two at a time. Um, I find socks aren't like my number one favorite thing to knit. I think in large part because I like knitting that I can just keep doing without thinking. Like I've done projects where I have to be much more actively involved in instructions and I can be motivated to do that for like a specific end result that I'm really excited about. But my favorite knitting experience is when I can just do something super simple that I can just keep in my head and just do it for like hours on end, like while I'm just like relaxing and watching a show or something like that. So I think part of my issue with socks is that there are just like enough separate times throughout the process of making them that you're kind of doing some like special different thing that's very separate from how you've been knitting the rest of the sock. When do you start making the heel flap? And then when does that become a gusset and having to relook up the instructions for that every time? It's just, there's just all of these like separate little things that I feel like I'm constantly having to reference a paper, which I don't like, but this is why I like knitting two at a time because it means that at least I'm only going through that entire process once per pattern rather than getting start to finish in one. And then I'm not gonna remember every single step or when to do them when I'm knitting the second sock. So I don't wanna have to go through all that again. So at least when I knit things two up, I only have to figure it out once. Um, this is also an Aran Waite knit, which helps them knit up faster. And I think this was like maybe three hours of work getting it started and like technically more, but I'm not counting the like 40 minutes that I spent trying to remember how to cast on two at a time and then realizing that I was not in fact successfully casting on two at a time and decided, fine, I will go watch that YouTube tutorial again. And this is yet another example of the thing that I've touched on in previous videos, the law that if you think you've remembered how to do something in knitting correctly, you've gotten it wrong. If you do decide to take the time to look it up beforehand, you remembered it. Why did you bother wasting your time? Every single time. But I do think that these are gonna be cute. I like the texture that we've got going on. Um, it's a very simple repeat. So like at least when I'm just working on the leg of it, this is one that's really simple TV knitting. And I do have enough of this yarn that when combined with the leftover yarn from the last pair of socks that I made for my dad, which was also Phil Colana Peruvian, but in the color heathered chocolate, maybe dark chocolate, something like that. Um, but so between those two leftovers, I think I'm going to be able to make one like stripey pair of socks for my dad. So that's what I'm thinking will be the Christmas sock knit, maybe Father's Day for feeling ambitious, but when his birthday's in March, Father's Day is just like a little too close. TBD. I'm also thinking that on this pair, I might try doing the Fish Lips Kiss Heel, which I've never done before. For some reason, I actually bought the pattern for this like, like two years ago. Like I, right when I started knitting, I was like, oh, this is brilliant. I should do it. I should buy. And I don't buy patterns that I'm not immediately knitting. That's not my like pattern purchasing habit. So I don't really know what possessed me to do that. But in any case, it's been sitting in my Ravelry library for like two years. And every time I've knit a pair of socks, I have just knit what the pattern told me to. So I think that this time I'm going to try to figure out the Fish Lips Kiss Heel and see how I feel about knitting it, how dad feels about wearing it since he's my primary sock wearer at this point. Um, so we'll see, but I'm kind of curious to try that out. But as you can see, we are currently very far from a heel. So there's more to be done on this yet, but I do have more than a month. His birthday's in late March, so we're in good shape. Also on the topic of my family watching my podcast, my sister told me that um, my nephew Chase, who is eight, his new hobby is checking my YouTube subscriber count and announcing it to their household. <laughs> and she was like, Chase also told me to tell you that you should be posting once a week because that's what all the best YouTubers do. So I guess I now have a manager. He's eight years old and I'm gonna have to step up my game. I don't know. I don't really know how I'm gonna manage one a week and have time to actually knit to have things to show in the video. But like the YouTube expert has spoken, I I can't argue with that. I also really like that Chase has this interest in my channel because a few months ago I was looking after him and his sister while their parents were away for a few days. And the first night that I was there, he was like, I'm really not sleepy. Like I just, I'm so awake. I couldn't possibly go to sleep. And I was like, I know how to make you fall asleep real quick. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on a knitting podcast. Do you know what a knitting podcast is? And he was like, what is a knitting podcast? <laughs> and I literally put on an episode of a knitting podcast. And first of all, he paid way more attention than I expected him to, which I probably shouldn't have been like that surprised about because if I'm knitting when I'm with him, he will often kind of like check out what I'm doing and ask questions about it. But he both had like 
thoughts and questions about what he was watching and also was like yeah i'm getting sleepy after like seven minutes on the podcast <laughs> so this then became for the duration of that visit our bedtime routine every night it was like okay which knitting podcast are you gonna choose and you know what he had opinions like one day i put one on and he was like i don't like this one let's find a different one <laughs> so shout out to marissa makes editors know her channel is actually called marissa made because she was his favorite or actually she was She's like too much fun. She actually wasn't very helpful for the getting to bed goal because he was laughing too much. So highly recommend for a high energy knitting podcast that is not gonna put you to sleep even if you're an eight year old. So moving out of whips, I actually have acquisitions to move into which is like very unusual. I'm a very project specific yarn buyer. So if I'm not starting a new project, I usually don't have new yarn, but I was the beneficiary of multiple de-stashes in the last few weeks. So first of all, that means that I spent zero money on this yarn. So as far as what knitting is costing me this month, absolutely nothing. And that is very impressive because I was at the knitting loft in Toronto a couple of weeks ago and I bought nothing. So I was there with my friend Amy who lives out in Alberta now, but she was home visiting and she'd never been to the knitting loft and really wanted to go check it out. So I was there with her and our friend Brooke who's also gotten into crochet recently. So she also has an interest in yarn and it's such a beautiful yarn shop. They have so many things. They have knitting for olive, they have hedgehog fibers, they have La Bien Aimé, like they just, Oh, so much good stuff. And I bought none of it, none of it, which I kind of feel like I deserve some credit for, but also it's not really that remarkable because I don't know, I, I struggle with the idea of buying yarn and not knowing exactly what I'm making with it because I'm so picky that I'm like, what are the odds that like, if I have yarn in my stash, what are the odds that I'm going to find a project that fits both that gauge of yarn and that amount of yarn and that I want to make in that color of yarn. And then it's a pattern that I like really genuinely love. And given the limited amount of garments I can make in a month, a year, a lifetime, do I love this enough for it to be one of them? Like that's just a really high bar to me. And this is a problem I was running into with the Hank of Hedgehog's fibers that I showed in my first knitting podcast where I was asking for suggestions of what to make with it because I'm now in the situation where I have a yarn that I'm trying to like reverse engineer into a pattern. And while there are lots of patterns that of course it would work for, I'm still struggling to settle on a pattern that it will work for and that I love enough to want that to be what I knit. So that is still up in the air. I did get some really good suggestions from people, which I think I'll talk about in a future episode when I kind of come back to that yarn and actually start doing something with it. But it's just hard. Like I think I am just a person who really needs to choose which project I want to commit to and then buy the yarn specifically for it. That said, if someone is offering me free yarn that is beautiful, Am I going to turn it down? Not this time. The first D stash that I got to benefit from was Amy's. So Amy started knitting, I think a couple years before I did. And I have gotten to benefit from watching her like learn things the hard way. So a lot of Amy's D stashing are like things she bought online that like didn't end up working like the way she thought they were going to for one reason or another. Um, and a lot of them are really nice things. Like this skein of Felix from La Bienname um, in the color Winterfell. And like, look how good this color is. This is beautiful. And this is 75% uh, Falkland Merino, 25% Corydale. So all wool, just a couple different kinds. And this is 100 grams or about 650 meters, 710 yards. Um, what am I making with this? What a great question. I need to do a swatch. This is, I think, technically a lace weight yarn. I think it's kind of on the cusp, actually. I think it's like kind of thick for lace, but I'm wondering if I can make with it the Fausta Bralette by Low Key Bold Knit. Now, one of the factors here is that that is a DK weight knit. So first of all, I need to figure out what I need to hold this double, triple, or even quadruple to make that happen. And I also, if I were to make this pattern, I think I would want to knit it actually to be like a full length top rather than a bralette. So I will definitely need more of this if I'm going to do that. The question is just how much more. And then I think I'm going to need to alternate skeins probably because they obviously are very unlikely to be from the same dye lot. But I've had the Fausta Bralette in my favorites for quite a while now and I've been picturing doing it in some sort of dark color and I feel like this would be the absolute perfect color for it. So I'm like, okay, I will need to order more, but this still makes it a big discount on what this project would have cost me if I didn't get one skein of it for free. And again, like I'm really picky. I think that I would like that project a lot more than if I just came up with something that I could knit using only this, you know? So that's what I'm currently thinking, but I do need to do some swatch experimenting to figure out how many strands I'm gonna need to hold. And actually, please let me know if you have used Felix for a DK weight knit, how many strands did you hold and what kind of fabric did you get? Please let me know. Okay, and continuing Amy's purchases of beautiful hand dyed yarn that I now am the recipient of, can we discuss this hank? Like, look at it, it's beautiful. 
And so in my first episode, I was talking about um, kind of having like a bit of a sudden interest in variegated yarn that I hadn't had before when I kind of realized that I, I think I gravitate much more toward ones where there's not a lot of difference in lightness and darkness and it's more just color, which this one fits exactly. Like if you took a screenshot and you turned to black and white, this would all look very similar in gray because the main difference here is just the blue to purple shift and not a light to dark shift. So very nice of Amy to be de-stashing a variegated yarn that fits exactly my criteria. So this is from Ginger Twist Studio, which apparently is in Edinburgh, Scotland. And this is the color Midnight Tinkerbell, is that what that says? So yeah, so this is a 100 grams, uh, 400 yards, 366 meters, um, and it is a 60% superwash merino, 20% yak, 20% silk. I also have a couple of little straggler balls of it because, so this yarn was supposed to be for such a good project for Amy that I like got to witness the rise and fall of. <laughs> and oh god, this, this yarn was... 23.50 in pounds this is a pricey yarn you see it, it pays to have friends with good yarn taste who buy too much yarn um but so this was supposed to be part of this beautiful striped turtleneck that she was knitting it was like a cream color for the base of it and then it had these like little stripes in this color and it was so beautiful but she had some concerns about like how blocking was going to affect it and so she did kind of like a mid-project block when she was, I think, maybe like halfway done to kind of get a sense of how it was going to turn out. And it was a disaster. Like, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. I think her sleeves ended up being like twice as long as a human arm. Like, the growth on the superwash was like wild. I don't think it was because of this one. I think it was the cream base that she was using. Um, and the texture of that cream yarn also did some really weird thing when it was blocked. It just... It went from being so promising and so beautiful to being a complete and total frog. So very disappointing. Um, and hopefully I can now turn this into something nice. But again, we're in the scenario of what do I make with this? So like this doesn't say on it what the weight is, but like I would guess that's like a lace weight. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very good at gauging these things. I was going to say something about that being punny, but now I'm realizing that like I think the term like to gauge something literally comes from measuring the gauge of something like not specifically yarn you measure the gauge of a lot of things but I don't think that's punny at all I think that's just how words work okay my last acquisition that I got from Amy is some double Sunday. she gave me two of these in this sort of steely blue color and I'm thinking these will probably make their way into a pair of socks for my dad now, I'm not sure that the two balls will be enough to make a pair of socks for him on his own they probably won't be quite enough but I could definitely integrate like a little bit of stripiness or like color blocked toes and heels and like a little stripe around the ankle and probably make it work. And I think this is very much a color that he would happily wear. So excellent. Merry Christmas, dad. Okay. <laughs> the acquisitions continue with this gigantic bag. I went over to my grams and poppies for dinner and Graham sent me home with this enormous bag, which first of all, this is a bag that her friend made for her years ago. Um, and there is like manually applied glitter on here. Like this is like, an intense project. Respect. So there's all kinds of things in here, um, some of which have labels and some of which don't, and the ones that don't she has absolutely no idea what they are. So we have this one, which like, it's a lot of something. <laughs> it's actually, I have, I have a sample of something it was knit up into, which, so years ago, Grams made me a pair of mittens that had this cool sort of like dragon scaly texture on it. And when I went to visit her this time and she pulled out this stash, um, she showed me that this was like a prototype. I guess she wasn't following a pattern for this mitten. Like she had just found like the, the stitch pattern for this texture and then was just trying to make a mitten based off of it. So we were just dying because this was her like trying to figure out like how to work a thumb in. And I love it so much because look at the thumb. <laughs> this is not the shape of anybody's hand. <laughs> this is like, it's like a Martian hand. Like, let me, let me put it on. Just like, like if I were to actually try to, like we're, we're getting a bit closer, but like none of the base of my thumb is in there. There's also this fun little peekaboo at the top. I just, this is so delightful to me. I kind of want to like frame it in a shadow box. So that's how this works up. Um, it looks quite a bit darker as a mitten actually. That's funny. I guess it's just all the texture of the dragon scales. But so like, is this wool? Is it superwash wool? Is it synthetic? Is it a blend of the two? We have no idea. So I guess what I need to do is just make a swatch and then wash it and see what happens. Um, no idea. What am I gonna make with it? No clue. And then there's like, there's like sweater quantities of things in here. And I was like, Rams, what were you planning to make with this? And she's like, oh, I have no idea. 
and she doesn't need it anymore because it hurts her hands. So reminder to all of us, and I include myself in this, do your hand exercises while you're knitting. Don't just knit for hours and not do that or someday you won't be able to knit. Like there's a good chance you won't be able to knit someday anyway, but at least make it last as long as you can. Okay, so, ooh, this is like very soft. Okay, so this one is 100% acrylic. We know what this one is. So this is the Galaxia 5 in this sort of like grayish purpley color and like so much of it. <laughs> like, oh my God, oh my God. There's another one too. Oh, this one has been like partly used. But so we have like four and a half of these that I need to figure out what I'm gonna do with them. There's also one of the same in this like burgundy color and it has a lot of like sheen to it. I don't know if you can really tell, but it looks, it's very like actively shiny. And she also gave me, I swear, like a sweater's quantity of this black yarn that I was like, Grams, what were you gonna make with this? And she's like, I don't know. I probably just bought it thinking I was gonna make something. What? Also, if you're Canadian, Eaton, like as in the Eaton Center, like this ball of yarn is so old that it is from when there was just a store called Eaton. So we have Eaton Parlay by Lady Fair in this black color. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Are there more? I can't hold more. Oh God. Nine? Ten? Oh my god, Grams, what were you doing with all of these? <laughs> then we also have this really fun miscellaneous bag of like funny, like textured yarns. So we have this one that it's like super thin, but then has these funny tufts, but like way more spread out than like a boucle or something. It's like, it just has like little like confetti tufts along it. Um, so I imagine like, I guess if you knit like a lace weight thing out of this, maybe it would kind of have a similar effect to a book. Like you'd have to be knitting this really tight together. I don't really know. I don't know. What would you make with this? Please tell me. And there's also this one, which like, if we thought the other one was shiny, like this is like iridescent in this like baby blue color. And it's like, it's like flat. Like it's not, it's not like a round strand. Also, what do you knit with flat yarn? Unknown, let me know. And then we have this one, which also looks like it's probably very old. <laughs> and this one's actually 100% cotton, um, but it's this funny, like, nubbly texture. And just one ball of this one. So we have some very interesting yarns going on that I have no idea what I'm going to do with. But if you have ideas, please let me know. I was just putting all that stuff away and I just found this one little ball of yarn that was in this stash from Graham's. We'll make something real good out of that. Okay, that's the end of my acquisitions, which brings us to future plans, which are not so much plans at this point as just like vague brainstorming, but I've been thinking that maybe my first foray into like trying to kind of like improvise knit something for myself might be a pair of fingerless gloves, but kind of weird ones, so stick with me. So <laughs> I have been on a quest for my dog Copper's entire life to find the perfect dog walking gloves to absolutely no avail. Like I bought several and they're all great and terrible in different ways. Like I think broadly, if you're walking a dog, you have the issue of like trying to open a poop bag with a glove on, but then also more specifically with Copper, like he's a very vigilant creature with very big feelings, which means that when we're walking, we're not just like having like a chill, calm stroll. Like if stuff's going on in the neighborhood, we're like training. We're like, wow, yes, we saw that amazing, great job. Which means that I need to be able to very easily like grab and deliver quite small treats quite quickly, which is hard with gloves. And so I sort of have some that are like thin enough that I can feel what I'm doing like relatively well, but then they're not that warm and like the whole thing isn't very thick. So the whole rest of my hand is cold. I have a pair that's much thicker, so they're much warmer and they are still gloves. So I do still have some dexterity, but it's really hard to feel what I'm doing and like grab food very well. And then I have a pair of fingerless gloves, but they stop like here. So like a lot of my fingers cold. And I'm like, well, really, I just need like my fingertips. And like, maybe I only need my like thumb and index finger. Like, do I even need my other fingertips? I don't know. So I kind of am tempted to try to figure out what my ideal dog walking glove would be and see if I can make it. Like maybe it's a pair of gloves, except you just don't knit like this part of these two fingers. 
and like possibly only on one hand because I don't need to be able to do it with both hands. <laughs> do I just need a pair of gloves where two of the fingers are just fingertipless, not even fingerless, fingertipless? This is what I'm considering right now. So that's a possible future plan. But at this point in the winter, like I don't think that's going to happen before this winter is over. So it's probably something I would more be trying to finish up like later this year as we head into fall and winter of next year. So I'm just gonna let that like percolate for a little bit. Okay, Copper has come to listen in on our not knitting corner. So if you didn't catch my first episode, I mentioned that I have a lot of other kind of like creative hobbies that are separate from knitting that I would like to touch on at the end of these videos. So if you're only interested in the knitting stuff, I 100% get it. Thank you so much for being here. And this is where I'll leave you. So if you like this, please do like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you next time. So for those of you like Copper who wish to stick around for this portion, last time we went over books in kind of a similar format to a knitting podcast. So in terms of finished objects, um, this is the one that I had been reading last time. This is The Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed, which I was saying at the time that I was just starting but was really enjoying. And that continued, that did not change. It was fantastic from beginning to end and like her writing only got better. Like I was looking to see if she had a new book out and was disappointed to see there isn't one out yet, but excited to see that she is working on one. So I will definitely be picking that up. I just found her writing, while it very much fits in the category of YA, it also definitely leans a bit more like poetic or literary than average in sort of a like Nina LaCour kind of way. It kind of reminded me of her style at times. I just was much more often like taking note of really beautiful language a lot more often than I usually am in YA, which is not at all a slam to YA. Like I love YA, it's my preferred genre, but this one really stood out to me and I really loved it. So I'd really recommend. Okay, Copper's gone, so we no longer need the camera adjusted to accommodate him. Okay, so my current reading whip is Lights. So this one is the um, third graphic novel in the sheet series by Brenna Thumler, which is so good. It's so like sweet and wholesome. Like I, I think the age range on it is actually like nine to 12. Like it's appropriate for pretty young kids and it's just a delight. And like the entire thing looks like this. Like the color palette is just, just beautiful. It's just so good. And <laughs> I'm partly reading this right now because I've really needed a quick win because I've had false starts with two books in a row now. Like I am usually pretty good at picking books that I'm going to like, and it's not very common for me to decide not to finish a book. I feel like honestly, I should probably do that more often than I do. I'm like trying to make myself <laughs> be more willing to put books down because I think sometimes when I get into a reading slump, it's because I tried to power through books that I shouldn't have. And like, I would have read more books overall if I had just given up on those ones. And like, I didn't dislike them while I was reading them. But it was also this feeling of like, I feel like I've been sitting here a really long time and I haven't gotten through very many pages and I feel very cognizant of like how long it's taking me to read how little and how like unmotivated I feel to continue sitting here and reading very few pages for very much time. <laughs> so they have now made their way into the little free library of my neighborhood. They just did not do it for me, but I also don't read a ton of literary, which I think is what these both fall into. I do read some and I've enjoyed quite a bit of it, but these do in particular, which is not it for me. The last time I was also talking about my own query process with the book that I have written and I'm working toward trying to publish, um, the second one that I'm pairing that with, um, and so since that first episode, I think I've done like kind of an overhaul on my query and I've done like a rough kind of like brute force edit on my opening pages where I changed all the concrete things I need to change. And now I'm working on like trying to make it sound good again, <laughs> right? Like trying to make the writing good on a line level. Cause I was just sort of like slashing and like hacking stuff in really quickly just to get it in there and to understand where things were going to fit in now that I was kind of shifting things around. But now I'm at the stage where like, like the best way that I can explain it is that your first five to 10 pages, because that's all that an agent sees when they decide if they want to see more from you. Those first five to 10 pages have to do a lot, right? They have to set up so much, right? They have to convey so much. They have to set up so much of the story in so little time that they're kind of by nature, very contrived, right? Like you've had to really figure out which like puzzle pieces you can squeeze together very strategically to make sure that you get a little bit of all the most important things in there. And therefore it is very contrived. And as a result, like right now with my draft, it reads as contrived. Like if you read these first five pages and then read a random five pages in the middle of my manuscript, they don't sound anything alike. <laughs> like the first five pages just sounds so much more like shoehorned in to fit than the rest of it does. So now I'm trying to like uncontrive something that is like inherently contrived. Like I'm trying to make it sound like natural and sound like the rest of my writing. And <laughs> it's just, it's just so hard.
it's just so hard to do. So I, I've been working on it for like weeks and I feel like every time I work on it, I make like this much progress. Like it's just so slow and I do feel like it's getting there, but it's just like, my God, like you'd think that like writing a whole book would be the hard part, but it's really not. It's really not. All right, I think that's all I've got to talk about in the non-knitting world today. So if you stuck around for this portion, thank you so much. I was so delighted by a few comments in my first video being like, oh my God, I'm a bookworm too. Like I was so delighted when it got to the end of your video and you were talking about that. It was just so sweet because I wasn't sure anyone was going to care. I, I was fully expecting that the viewership graph on that video was gonna go like meow at the time <laughs> that I transitioned out of knitting stuff. And like, of course there's a little bit of a drop, but there was not nearly as much of one as I expected there to be. So I think that somehow all of the right people found my channel and I'm so grateful for it. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for watching. Um, please do like and subscribe if you'd like to stick around and I hope to see you next time. Bye.